Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're all well. I'm just going to start off uh, this session by doing a quick sound check. So if you can hear me, please type yes into the chat box located on the right hand side of your screen. Can everybody hear me? Let's make sure we're live and the audio is working. Fantastic. Still got a couple of people joining us. Welcome. Good morning. No, good afternoon. Sorry. Good afternoon. Fantastic. It looks like you can hear us. Fantastic. So just a quick introduction from me. My name is Chantelle Newton and I'm the marketing manager at the UK Contact Centre Forum. Um, and I'm also editor of our online e-magazine Contact Centre Monthly. I've just got a few housekeeping points to go through before we begin. Today's session will include some polls for you to participate in. So when prompted, the polls will appear on a separate box on your screen. Simply select the answer that applies to you from the list provided, and then the results will be automatically collected and shared with you, our audience, and with our panellists for them to discuss. After our presentation today, we will be holding a full Q&A session. Please post any questions that you have uh, for our panel. If I could ask that you pop them in the chat box instead of the question box. So you should have a question box and a chat box, which is separate. Um, my panelists don't have uh, access to the question box today. So if you could pop that into the chat box for me, <coughs> that would be fantastic. So then our panelists can have a look at the questions you've got for them. Our webinar session is expected to last an hour today, and if you are unable to stay the whole session, we are recording today's session, and the link will be emailed to all participants within 24 hours of the webinar ending. After the webinar has ended today, we do have a quick feedback survey. Um, it's completely anonymous, and it will only take you a couple of minutes. Your feedback is so valuable to us, and it enables us to keep in improving these sessions and deliver what you, our audience, wants for the future. So we're going to get today's session started. I'm going to hand you over to Mike Harfield, COO of Signa Connected, and Joanne Regan Isles, who is the Chief People Officer from Signa Connected. But first, it's over to Mike. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everyone. Um, I think the first slide is not moved over on my screen, Chantal. Bear with me, sorry. There we go. <laughs> Apologise. So uh, absolutely not a not a sales pitch from us, I guess. Initially, our, our brand's very different to the other panelists, and I just really to say why I think perhaps we've got a, a view on on this topic and why we're so interested to, to be involved today. So we're a BPO offering uh, outsourced uh, white label um, contact centre solutions. Uh, we've got about three thousand agents. We're across six sites in three different continents, and that gives us a really interesting view of. The market or the, the, the labour market around the globe at the moment. Uh, we work across five different sectors uh, with six very specific uh, service offerings and I guess over the last 18-24 months our business has doubled in terms of FTE which I think it gives us a really good perspective of how, how this uh, labour market has evolved during during the pandemic and hopefully now into the post-pandemic. That, that may be slightly slightly ahead of myself there but as we're coming out slightly uh, we've got a good mix of uh, work from home and work from the office, so about 1,500 of our employees, certain that those are almost entirely UK-based employees, work from home. So we've, we, we've got a good understanding of the dynamic between uh, that, those work from home agents and, and the, and the office-based location guys at the moment. So hopefully that gives us a good context for today's discussion. Um, I think Joe's just going to talk a little bit more about the less, less Sigma-specific and the more uh, labour market-specific stuff. Thanks. Brilliant. That, thanks, Mike. So, good afternoon, everyone. So, next slide, please, Chantal. So, so as Chantal said, I'm I'm the Group People Officer. I've got over 20 years experience in HR, and I think the last 18 months have been really extraordinary for lots of different reasons. So, so thank you all for attending today because I I feel we're all in the same situation. So, it's going to be great to get lots of different you know, discussions going. And like Chantal said, please ask questions in the box. So, so I think at the moment, you know, in the media and speaking to colleagues all the time, you know, what are we facing, you know, as an industry? So if you can see here, you know, one in four workers are considering changing jobs in the next uh, next three to six months. You know, 30% of all frontline workers are thinking they're very likely um, to change jobs. Um, people are considering leaving the contact centre roles. Um, for better career prospects and better pay. Um, and, you know, from the frontline colleagues' point of view, what CCMA have said is, you know, the systems that we use are playing a huge part in that. 
two top priorities in the UK that we've seen are demonstrating that senior managers care about staff well-being, which is something close to my heart and I'm sure close to all of yours, and that senior managers understand the tools and applications that advisors use. Next slide, please, Chantal. Next, next slide, please, Chantal. I'm on the talent landscape. Oh, yeah, that's slide. brilliant. Yeah, perfect. So you can, so, sorry, yeah. So you can see here, um, you know, one of the reasons that we chose this subject to talk about today was really around, you know, what we're all facing in the moment in our business. You can see here, you know, staff shortages, you know, people are considering leaving because they want more flexibility, you know, retaining top talent and engagement is even more important. So, you know, from our point of view in the industry, you know, attraction and retention of our people to deliver for our customers, et cetera, you know, now we're all finding it a challenge, not just in the contact center area, but, you know, from our purposes today, it's really to find out what some of our panelists have been doing with that. So that's really the scene. Um, if, next slide, please, Chantelle, if there is one. Yep, I just wanted to give you a really high level overview before I move on to speak to the talent, to the um, panel about, you know, some of the things that Sigma have done over the past, you know, 12 to 18 months. One of the things that's worked really well for us is implementing mental health first aiders, because we realise that all of our employees are going through different challenges at work and at home. You know, we've launched the Sigma Community Foundation, um, which we're really proud of, and that's where we're going to be encouraging people to make a difference in their community. We've partnered with Treedom, so when people finish their probation, they, they get selected a tree, and that's going to grow in the Sigma Forest. We're doing lots of recognitions and monthly awards for people. One of the things that worked really well during lockdown for us um, was introducing Wellness Wednesdays. So we did desk yoga, we did mediation, we did fitness pilates. What we were trying to do is get people involved and also, you know, help people with both their mental health and their well-being. So some of these things that, you know, we, we've done over the last 12 to 18 months, it was very much listening to our employees, working with our employees. But I think what we'll find as we go through this session is that employees now want to work for organisations that are doing more. They want to feel part of it and also they want to feel part of the community and feel that we're making a difference, whether it be with CO2, with, with communities, etc. So that's some of the employee well-being that we've been doing. And I'd encourage anyone to perhaps consider doing some of these things if you're not already. So that, that's really just the, the end of the slide. So I'm now just going to move over to talk to the panel about what challenges they've faced during the last 18 months. So if, if I think, uh, uh, if I start with you, Joe, um, you know, at ASDA, you know, what, what challenges have you faced, um, you know, both at John Lewis and ASDA, because you're, you've only been at ASDA a couple of months now, but doing very well. So what challenges have you Thanks. faced? Thank you. So I think in terms of recruitment, um, there are a lot less applicants for roles. Um, I think the competition is um, amongst businesses to get the best candidates um, is tough. Um, and I think there's a real need to react quickly um, when recruiting um, candidates. And I think by the time, I mean, I've had personal experience of offering a role to a candidate who'd been offered a, another role in the interim um, and accepted another role. So, you know, there's, and there's absolutely a need to work with the business process, but to, to engage that um, engage that candidate um, all the way through the process from, from the, the first time you talk to them um, and the first time you have that interview. Um, and, uh, you know, another major challenge is some of those specialist skills that you require in the contact centres are just not out there in abundance. Everybody wants those same skills. Um, we've been recruiting a quality team uh, recently in ASDA and we were very fortunate to find some absolutely fantastic applicants. Um, but that wasn't easy and um, that took quite a while to do that and the process was quite protracted. So we were quite fortunate to be able to do that. So I suppose for, from my perspective, from what I've experienced um, in ASDA most recently, is you know the lack of skills and then the lack of applications because the competition is just so is just so fierce amongst businesses. Mm -hmm. And are you finding that you've changed some of your recruitment techniques, Joe, as well? Because like you say, I do agree, it's really around, you know, when, when you see those applicants applying, you know, making sure that you're quickly getting to them. So have you have you changed, you know, any of the ways that you have recruited, do you think? 
Yeah, absolutely. So it's just it's just that engagement right from the outset, as I described, and and making sure you stay in contact with that with that person before they start. So that that pre onboarding um, kind of focus. Um, but also in in one of my in one of my teams in particular, we've really focused on looking at not so much um, in experience, but really looking at competencies. Um, so in, in terms of um, actually, if it's a technical skill, if you haven't got that skill now, have you got the right competencies um, and have you got the right ethos to join ASDA and be part of that brand and be aligned to that brand? Because you can absolutely train those skills out. So sometimes I think, um, you might look at a CV and say, well, they haven't got exactly the right experience, but I think we need to look a bit wider and, um, uh, than what we do uh, you know, initially and, and think, have they got, have they got trainable um, skills that we can, we can absolutely use that person um, in our workforce? Brilliant. Thanks very much, Jo. And similar question to you, Mark, with the very group. You know, what have you found some of the challenges? Yeah, listen, I think that the, ch the challenges are unilateral in terms of the ability to recruit. The, the level of vacancies out there in the market at the moment are, are huge. And um, we, I, I think we have to change the way that we're recruiting as an industry. We have to, we have to create, you know, opportunities for people to join organisations that are not just about the pay, not just about the rations. It's about the experience of working for that organisation. It's about, you know, the level of care, the level of well-being, and, and you covered a lot of this, Joe, in your initial scenario, you know, it's got to be a rounded experience, and I think that's what a lot of people are looking for today, that means that they join a company that they have an affinity with, that they can see themselves working for for a long time, and are supported massively through that journey from a personal perspective, not just an employment perspective. Mm. Thanks, Mark. And finally, Mike, you know, what, what challenges do you think, you know, you, you lead on all the operations in Signa Connective. So, you know, what, what, what have you seen as some of the challenges? Similar to the other guys, I guess where I would distinguish is there's a very different uh, ability to attract, depending on whether we're, the, the role is work from home or work from the office. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're not finding attraction to be a challenge for work from home roles where we're, where we're advertising nationwide. Uh, we are, however, finding attraction a massive challenge if we're saying the role is predominantly office based or even if I'm, if I'm brutally honest, even if it's hybrid at the moment, the choice that people have, uh, if they don't, they don't have to apply for something that's hybrid or office based. And whilst there are those people that do want an office, they enjoy the commute, they want, they want to get away from home. I have to say I'm, I'm one of those. I like to have that, that separation in my life. Uh, I, I'm very aware I'm in the minority. So, so attraction is is definitely kind of topic number one for me, and that's that's our second biggest concern. Our, our biggest concern at the moment is retention, and I think we'll we'll come on to talk about that as we go through the session. But retention, whether we're work from home or office based in the UK specifically at the moment, is is hugely challenging for for, for many of the reasons that, that the panel have already covered. But that that to me is a bigger challenge than the out and out attraction. There are things there are things we can do and levers we can pull for attraction. Retention is poten potentially there are forces bigger than all of us that, 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 that make retention in contact centres hugely challenging just now. And mo moving on now to talk more specifically, Mike, you know, for, from your point of view, you know, can you can you tell us how you think things have changed in the UK? you know, over the past 18 months, because, you know, we've all been in the contactor industry for many years. We've all seen these many changes. So so can you can you just give us your thoughts on that, please? I'll try and do this without depressing the hell out of everybody. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure everybody on, 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 the, on the calls is, is on the call for the same reason. You know, the, cha the changes have been, have been massive. Uh, in our business, we're in kind of a fortunate position to be able to see the juxtaposition between the old and the new. We've got a South African operation and a UK operation, and the two are behaving so differently just now. In wow. South Africa, we've got, I guess, pre-COVID rules apply. Our staff are almost exclusively in the office. Therefore, we're recruiting regionally. Um, the, the, there's, only, there's, a, there's a reasonably high, a very high unemployment level. So that kind of applicant pool is, is there for us to get high performing staff. Uh, flip that on its head and look at the UK. And I, I, don't, I don't profess to understand whether it's Brexit, COVID, technology, work from home, environmental or economic 
um, forces, but a, a smorgasbord of those things has completely, certainly in our experience, transformed the UK labour market. Um, kind of what we're finding is we can't be any less than anybody else at anything. We have we have to be try to aspire to be more. Uh, the choice that potential candidates have got is so so high at the moment. So, certainly, the high performing candidates have have more choice than I think they've ever had. Certainly, than I've ever seen. And for us, for us to compete and then to retain, we have we have to be at least as much. So if if other roles are 100% home based and we go and advertise a role that's less than 100% home based, I know that our application levels will be incredibly low and our retention for those that do come. Well, actually, our, our people who show up today, one will be much bigger drop off than we would have seen previously, and then through training and into into BAU CVs are staying out there waiting for that role that gives them the flexibility. So so that's kind of driven certainly us and I think many of the people I speak to to a, a leaning towards work from home and that that in of itself brings kind of a challenge that keeps us awake at night is that makes the employee employer relationship very depersonalized you've now got a member of your staff who you've never met probably been recruited by somebody you've never met working for a team manager you've never met and they're sat at home on a laptop uh, which could just as easily have been any other business's laptop. And that, that challenge is huge for us. We, we like to say that we're a business where we thrive because of our culture, because of the way we do things, because of our ethos and our energy. And trying to engender that into people under those circumstances is, is massive. It, it drives an ability for people to job hop. Job hopping is now pretty, pretty easy. It's faceless. You don't even talk to your boss. You just you use the same laptop on the same sofa and you do the next the next job so so those those are the challenges that i guess we're, we're trying to we're, we're trying to get over and many of the things you showed in your side joe are our, are our attempts to do so and they they all talk to the same point we need to do something a bit more as mark said just changing the pay that's that's not the point when we when we talk to our staff they want more than that we, we notice that if an occupancy level in a campaign gets high people leave that campaign if 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 there's an easier way to earn the same money or a more stimulating way to earn the same money people will leave that campaign um you know we we need i think as a group of people to stop like it, it was an interesting thing i heard the other day a, a new recruit referred to our onboarding journey as better than their last gig and i thought that's right that's really cool they, they've enjoyed the they've enjoyed the onboarding and then it struck me we're not supposed to be a gig it's not supposed to be a transactional you're in for a bit and you're on to your next one um engagement that, that, that's not what that's not what we're offering so I think the onus is on us now. We're accepting work from home has a long-term role to play in our business. That 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 gig mentality needs to go, and we need to find a way. And I, I'd like to think we're doing a decent job of it of bringing people into our business, even if they're not physically in our business. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, Mike. That's really useful. Thank you. And Mark, moving on to the very group then. So uh, can you share some of the you know, you've got you've, you've won lots of awards and things like that. So I'm really interested in, you know, what the Very Group have been doing du during the last 18 months. Yeah, I think lots of the things you just talked about, Joe and Mike, uh, in particular, I think we, we're trying to create an environment and we're trying to create a different type of culture where people are part of a almost a movement into creating what the future of customer care looks like and. That goes with the physical environment that, that people work with it. It goes with the flexibility that Mike's just talked about. And I'm going to be slightly controversial. I, 100% working from home for me, will never fully work, I don't think, because we'll lose a, a power of connection and we'll lose a culture as an organisation. But what we have to have is flexibility. And we've been working with the teams to find out what that flexibility is. Now, at the minute, it's one day a week in the physical environment and it's four days a week at home that could become one day a month one day a quarter it could become two days a week i don't know and i don't think we all fully know what that future is going to be and i guess what we've been trying to do is build that co-create that with our teams to make sure that the environment fit the environment in the physical locations are about collaboration when people are together they're not answering phone calls or web chats they're, they're working on problems, they're bonding as a team, they're having one-to-one -one and create the right environment to change for movement and to be a team that improves our customer experience. From an attraction perspective, of course, Mike's right, minimum standards are to stay in step with the market. 
to try and be better where you can from a pay from a benefits perspective because that's just the hygiene factor but it's about what you then build on top of that and i guess what we're trying to create here at the very group is one team you know we've brought a lot of teams together under the banner of customer care that were perhaps fragmented before and we've created a similar environment where people feel they've got a voice and the where people can help us create flexibly what that future is but you know, we just try to have a load of fun along the way as well and, and, and remove some of them perhaps old stigmas of customer care you just sat at your desk all day you don't get any time to do anything else you, you know you're not in step with the rest of the business so you know if we close the business for a day for well-being exercise we close our contact centers we don't create we're not going to create an us and them mentality and i think that's really important in the customer care environment moving forward is often customer care the warehouse other jobs have been seen as well we can do that for everybody else but we can't do that for them we can't turn the phones off well i think we've got to be braver as organizations and and create equality across the organization and we're on a path to do that i wouldn't say we've got it fully right yet but we've been focusing heavily on people's well-being you know we've, we've brought an external consultant uh, dr greg wells that we're using here at the very group you know, we're closing, you know, we're regularly switching the phone lines off and investing in our people. And I think they're all big signs of how the industry needs to change moving forward. And, and, and Mike summed it up. The power between the business and the employee has completely changed. We are an employee driven nation now, particularly in the UK. And we've got to listen and we've got to support. We've got to create that equality. And that's what we've been trying to do here. Jo. Yeah, no, brilliant. I, I love that way you switch the phones off and everyone's evolved. I, I just think that's brilliant. So thanks for sharing that. That was really, really good. Um, so moving on to to Joe. So 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 Mike's talked about Joe some of the some of the challenges we faced in the past. You know, Mark's talked about you know some of the great stuff that Ready Group are doing now. Um, so do you just want to share before we go on to the questions? Um, you, you know what the plans are for 2022 for Asda, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of customer support, um, the the absolutely overriding um, kind of key thing with recruitment, as I kind of intimated earlier, is looking beyond experience and looking in people's uh, histories and looking through their CVs for those nuggets that you can see the potential of trainable skills. Um, I think for frontline workers, it's absolutely imperative we do that. Um, really beginning to widen the appeal, as Mark's um, discussed, widen the appeal of the contact centres. Um, so really looking at how we can um, attract a different, um, you know, people that wouldn't necessarily um, focus on contact centres um, initially, um, but really looking at how we can widen, widen our appeal. Um, and in terms of retention, for me, um, the most important thing is people understanding um, that retention starts as soon as that person um, accepts that role with you. So that pre-onboarding thing is absolutely imperative. So how you get that, um, you know, future employee or colleague engaged from the outset, you know, in conversations with their manager before they start, company information, to ensure that they feel really part of the team. So that's not just about ensuring they don't get poached by somebody else during that period of before they start but that's also making sure they start um, in a really positive way um, and they already feel part of part of the company and part of the team and i think that's absolutely more challenging in a in a hybrid in a, a remote environment um, and that is a that's a big challenge i think for asda for it for for all of uh, for all organizations and i think for us more widely as, a, as an organisation and the function that um, the contact centre um, is in, it's you know, within the head offices, it's very much work where it works. So complete flexibility, ensuring that um, colleagues have the have the option, what works for them. So, you know, I've got a bit of guidance a couple of days of, um, in the office, um, but that is absolutely down to the, the colleague and the um, and the line manager to, to sort. I think that the focus needs to be on the individual as well. So seeing some absolutely fantastic um, organisations, you know, the very group as well, you know, great collaboration spaces, you know, some really brilliant things. But people want to go to the office for different reasons. So it may well be for collaboration and it may well be for um, 
just actually because I can't work at home and I want to get out. So we need to absolutely take away thinking around averages um, and absolutely think about those individuals. What do those individuals need? Um, and for, for me, in the running the contact centre function, that is going to be a key focus. So how can I make the space that I've got work for the people that want to work in the office and the people that want to work at home? And also, how can I equip my leaders with being able to manage effectively in both of those environments because it is a different skill set um, so how can we support managers with being able to balance that because uh, in my experience over covid we previous role within john lewis we absolutely focused on well-being was the right thing to do but we we get to a point where actually how can you manage performance if that needs to be if that needs to be addressed so for me it's around um key recruitment initiatives it's around retention that pre-onboarding and then really looking at how we practically embed work where it works so it does actually work for the individual colleagues brilliant thanks very much joe that was really interesting um and just uh, just on a thought from each of you really um you know what would you you know what would you what would you say that you've learned over the past 18 months i'll start with you mike um that COVID was the start. So for, for, for a while, we were all, I think we were all thinking we've got to manage through this wave of the pandemic and the old days are coming back. And uh, and, I, and I think probably everybody on the call by now has realised the old days aren't coming back. Uh, the, the, big, the biggest learning that we've had is that they're not coming back from a, for a bunch of reasons. For, from a technological point of view, we've all, everybody's got better at deploying tech to enable people to, 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 to come Joe's place to work where it works. You know, not very many of us could do that pre-pandemic. So, so cer certainly as a business, we've learned how to do that way better. Uh, our clients similarly have learned the same thing and have therefore opened their minds to, to, to that fact too, that we may be able to just deliver in a different way, but deliver a better, a better outcome. So that, that, that's been, that's been a huge learning for us. Um, a, a personal learning I've had is that I'm a dinosaur. The way in which the way in which I think about life is very different to the way in which our agents think about life. And biggest, the biggest learning I've had is go talk to these guys. Go talk to the guys when they come into the business and find out how it feels at the coal face now. How it feels at the coal face now is very, very different to how it felt 100 years ago when when we were all starting out. Um, you know, it, it never ceases to surprise and impress me that I don't get asked you used to get asked, what do you earn, mister? When do I get your job? You now get asked about how responsible is your biz, is, your, is the business that these guys are joining, kind of how how seriously do we take our responsibilities both both to staff, to the environment, and to creating our own talent internally. People that we're employing, certainly the people when we employ the correct people, they're asking those questions and it's fantastic. I absolutely love it when I go in and those are the those are the things people want to know. How do I how do I better myself? How do I better my environment? And that in of itself has created a huge challenge because it used to be for us to better our environment was was quite a provincial thing. We could say, well, 10 miles of the office, we'll go do we'll go do some outreach stuff and it and it will be great. Well, we're now saying, well, very few of our guys are within 10 miles of our office. So improving our environment is now a wholly different challenge and kind of we, we no longer have that one size fits all supporting a local charity doesn't work anymore supporting kind of local causes doesn't work we we have to figure out a way of creating a much wider outreach and i guess to to, to joe's point one of the initiatives we're looking at there is do we have to have regional hubs if we are going to accept some percentage of our workforces perpetually at home and isn't located where we are do we need office space and i don't mean contact center i mean space for our staff to go to collaborate to mix to if they want coaching they want support they want the stuff we would have done in the office do we just have to have those facilities in, in in kind of high populous areas in the uk and that that's something that we're about to start trialing to see we we're really formative on this stuff we don't we don't profess to say we know it's right but certainly from talking to our staff the isolation of working from home may be great to a few of us but many of them from time to time would like some interaction so so we're going to try that and i think I, I think that will be a learning for us next year perhaps more than more than this year okay thanks mike mark what about yourself what what do you think you you know you've perhaps learned over, over the past uh, you know 18 months what an 18 months it's been I, i'd echo everything mike said to be fair i think listen i think the power of listening has been 
huge. Um, you know, what the last 18 months has done is, has made everybody's voices much louder. And I think that's an amazing thing for us as an industry and has given us huge insight into how we can move the business forward. I think the second is there's no prescribed model and we shouldn't all be trying to follow a prescribed model. It culturally will be different in each organisation and you need to find the right rhythm and heartbeat for you and that will only come through the listening that I've just described. Okay and Joe, finally uh, what do you think you've learned over the past 18 months? Well, wow, we've only got half an hour left, Joe. Oh, but um, I think I think for me, um, two key things. Um, the first most important thing is that organisations need to move to um, having relationships with employees. So the employees need to feel they're in a relational kind of um, state with the organisation, not a transactional one. Um, and I think that's you would think that's harder to do when you're you're remote and as Mike's kind of said earlier you can be sitting at home you log on at eight you log off at five um, and that's it your day's done you might not have interacted with anybody but I think what we learned over Covid is you actually can be in the office and not be connecting with anybody or connecting with the organisation you can be head down doing your work so I don't think sometimes it's not just about being in the office that doesn't necessarily bring connection with other people and a connection with the organization um, but also i think the biggest thing i learned um, was around actually covid you know obviously had you know amazingly negative consequences in a, in a lot of in a lot of ways but there's some really positive things that have come out for organizations so we all we all recognize and i think it's been widely reported around you know uh, you know necessities the mother of invention you know lack of red tape you get things through um uh, you know a lot of a lot of changes and um, went through organizations because they needed to happen quickly um but further to that when i look at my experience in the contact centers um when you needed to pull on um people frontline frontline agents um team managers to do something different because we just had to do it we had to have floor walkers we had to have different people doing training and what that provided was huge engagement because those employees and those colleagues actually felt they had variety and challenge in their role um, and for me i think we need to learn the lessons of covid the good things that have come out of covid and do more of them um, in more bau operating no, brilliant. Totally agree, Joe. Totally agree. So, so thanks very much for that. So, Chantal, are we now going to move over to the the questions? So, the question and answer session. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Ready when you are. Right. Okay. Um, so, if we go to the first question, what recommend what recommendations would you make for recruitment processes for call centres given the current situation? I'm happy to take this, and I think a lot of the the panelists have talked around this. Um, and, and I think from a recruitment point of view, uh, you know, pre-COVID, then, you know, as we all know, recruitment was done in the office. It, it was a very long process sometimes. Um, I think for me personally, and I, and I think my recommendation is that, you know, to Joe's point earlier, you know, we advertise using job boards or we use recruitment partners. Um, and if we're advertising directly, then we, we have to quickly get in touch with those candidates to talk to them. And I think it's really important, like Joe said, that, that the onboarding starts then. So, you know, you have that conversation with that individual, you talk about the organization. And, and I think, you know, they may not have had contact center experience or, you know, lots of different things. But I think if they've got, you know, the right skills and the right ethos and they're going through a really lengthy tra training program, you know, I think we need to, we all need to really reduce the recruitment program because if we don't, someone else will. So my thoughts on the recruitment process at the moment, and again, I think, you know, you know, we've learned things for the future is, you know, people don't want two hours or three hours for an assessment centre. You know, what people want is to get to know the company, because I think recruitment now is it's, it's, it's as much as that candidate thinking, do I want to work for Figma, Asda or the Very Group, that each of us are saying, well, actually come and work for us. So I think keep it simple. I think, you know, really, really focus on that whole board onboarding experience and get that connection with the individual so that, you know, they know that they're going to be joining the company that are going to get to know them as a person, help them grow. 
and it really is all about for me that that relationship so so hope that's helped but that that's my view i think take away the long processes really get to know your people because they're they're, they're going to be the people that are going to learn and grow with you so that was that one so the next question um you know i think um you know perhaps mark this one you know what sourcing strategies platforms you know are your recruiters in the very group finding most ben beneficial now and um, well I, I guess always the most powerful i think and and i love your guys view on this is is referrals from people within the organization because culturally that always works the best and obviously we're working we work heavily on kind of um, schemes to, to support people, helping us to find individuals. I think um, it, it will differ in industry by industry, but particularly in this industry, in the retail, uh, you know, we're lucky to be in retail and financial services, then what we're certainly encouraging people to do now is come into the organization at that kind of customer care level, but then grow into the rest of the organization. We're not recruiting, I mean, particularly in the UK now, we're not necessarily recruiting for the traditional customer care advisors that we did in the past. You know, in my world, we're recruiting for fraud advisors, collections advisors. These are people who are acting on a day-to-day -day basis as carers, um, consultants, you know, supporting people through vulnerability, investigating. There's, there's a real great career path these people can go on to in, inside and outside the organization, whether that's moving into retail teams, analytical roles, or going externally. You know, we've had lots of people come through our fraud department who, who wanted to go into the police, and it's been a great learning environment to do that. So we've been tapping into different universities, colleges, and schools, and, and different environments to really show people the type of skills that they can learn within the organization to take them on within their career. And, that's that's proven quite successful so far for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mark, that's that's really good. Thank you. Um, the next question: What are the top three elements impacting employee engagement once once they join your business? I mean, Mike, do you want to take that one? Oh, blimey. Okay. Um, so the first one, and it, it's 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 not a very people one, but and I think I mentioned it earlier. It's occupancy. So we 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 can see two parallel campaigns where we recruit through the same channels have the same duration of training delivered through the same tech whether it be on-prem or or work from home and we can see very different engagement and ultimately retention levels based on occupancy levels within that campaign and I, and I don't think I'm telling anybody anything that wasn't pretty obvious pre-pandemic but the choice that's now available to people I think amplifies it so if a we always used to talk about kind of an 85% occupancy level being a trigger for when absence might spike and uh, retention may start to go. And then what we, we call it a circle of doom. Once you're into that, the campaign's going to really have some some struggle because you can have a lower, lower tenure and a higher HD and all, all, all those kind of technical op stuff that, that, that causes us all so much misery. But what we're seeing now is where somebody may have weathered a slight spike in occupancy where it ran a 90% for a period of time. Actually, people vote with their feet now for all of the reasons that everybody's already said that I can redeploy my laptop um, yeah, and, and go, go and work at a job that's running at 75, 80% and have that work-life balance, not just have that eight hours a day of getting battered. And, uh, you know, for us, I guess I guess you've asked for three elements. I, For me, that's kind of, that's one, two, and three. If the work conditions within that campaign, you know, I think it has to be a given that we train our guys well. We wrap them in cotton wool when they come out of training. That the, the uh, if you call it a grad bay process, that that's done fantastically, so people land fully engaged once they're actually into the BAU operation. If the job itself is overly challenging, it clearly clearly these jobs are challenging. But if it's overly challenging, which in my experience is an obviously led point, people are voting with their feet, and we we can almost see it as quick as we can look at a, a, a workforce management tool to see what the occupancy is like we can see it from the re retention people are leaving instantly when it's like that now so mm -hmm. that kind of under understaffing i guess is, is is my biggest call out there mm -hmm. no thanks mike um and the next question i think i'll open it out to the three of you and, and i think this is a really good question around you know when when you've got an organization organ organization where there's people who've worked there a long time and then there's new people coming into the business some of the people that have, have longer tenure want to go back to the office, but perhaps some of the new employees 
you know, can't ever imagine going back to an office. They're really happy with working at home. So, and, and this person's asking, you know, um, there could be a bit of a, a disconnect. So, so, so how, 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 how are you dealing with that? Where, where, you know, you've got new people work at home and then some of the old, older tenured people, not old in age, want, want, to, want to go back to the office. So, so Joe, is there something else to, or John Lewis were doing around that? Yeah, I, I think uh, we've got a real mix. So we've got some people who are in the office that are new recruits who like being in the office. Um, and we've got some people that are at home. But I think where, where we're seeing the impact is um, people who really enjoyed, uh, yeah, tenured colleagues who, who uh, can look back at all the history, uh, talk about all the things that used to happen in the organisation when people were, you know, in the same space together. Um, and yeah, it is it is it is a challenge. Um, and I think there is that longing for people to come back in. Um, and then the new some of the new recruits, some of them are in, some of them aren't. So I mean, I haven't got an answer, Joe. It is just yeah. it is just a challenge in terms of you know trying to um and what the team leaders are trying to do is bring those teams together. And I think um, you know, really thinking about how you make that inclusive environment wherever that person is working um but it is it's a challenge we're facing into at the moment as well yeah no definitely especially now when you know there's more nationwide and it's not as easy for people to travel um you know i think the next one from 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 mark turner here is around hello mark is around um you know there has been a lot of bad press hasn't there we've seen it over the past couple of months around some organizations considering perhaps um you know decreasing employee salaries if they're remote working rather than going to the office um i mean and you know and the issues that would cause i mean my own thoughts on this are that you know i think the reason for this call today and that the, the problem we're having is around attraction and retention of people if we were to then lower the salary you know i, I don't think that would be a sensible approach i'd buy i would advise a business but equally I, I also think that, you know, we should be, um, you know, we should be even even if people are working at home or in the office, they're still really working hard, they're still delivering, we should be measuring people by their outputs. So I wouldn't recommend a business um, consider um, reducing the salaries, to be honest with you, I'd be interested on the panel if, if, if you've got a view on that. Same, same. I, I, I don't begin to understand that, that, that mentality, no. if I'm honest, we're, we're, we're expecting as much from the guys regardless of where they work, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in an environment with wage inflation, the choice that we've all described uh, and the, the kind of mental health challenges and just the general life challenges as minimum wage and living wage rises for us to lower base salaries feels like we get what we deserve. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Mark, Joe, have you got a different view? No, no, totally aligned. I think it's a short term way of losing lots of employees. <laughs> if I'm honest, I think, uh, <laughs> Yeah, sorry, Mark. The reality is, people, if they're not traveling to the office, will be working during their commute time that would be their commute time. So, okay. I think you get a lot, you know, people work tend to work, you know, might work longer hours when they're working at home because they haven't got that commute. So, I think, it, in, my, in my own personal opinion, not as his opinion, in my own personal opinion, it's absolutely short sighted. I think that's yeah. not the way that organizations should go. Yeah. So Mark Turner, we're all agreed, we're not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joanne, sorry, uh, Mark's also just asked, uh, could salaries increase with less overheads for remote workers? So it sort of ties into his questions. Apologies for interrupting. Yeah, no, and, and, I, and I think that's something that, you know, I, I think that's something, um, my own view of that is that that's down to a business to understand, um, you know, what's happening in their, in, in their business at the time. Um, but, but absolutely, it could be that companies, you know, offer higher salaries. I don't know. I don't know what the panel think to that one. Well, I've got. A, I don't know. I, I'm not convinced that cost the cost base has changed as much in the first instance. I think we all thought, well, who will let go of our leases and our property costs will go through the floor and these, these businesses are going to make a fortune. The reality for us, anyway, is we've increased the ratios of IT support to make sure people working away from the office have good connectivity engagement is now a more difficult thing so there's more support in and around the hr i guess i could go through the business we i can only speak for our business we put more support around people remotely than we ever did in the office and uh, i haven't done the maths but i'd be very surprised if it netted at 
less than what the rent would have been had we had them in the office. So it feels to me almost go back to the first answer. If they're performing great, we should pay them more because they're performing great. And almost to me anyway, it doesn't matter where they are. Mm -hmm. The next, the next question was uh, due to challenges in the UK recruitment market. Do we believe that um, companies will be looking at nearshore, offshore destinations to support their growth? So, uh, Mike, do you want to take that one to start with? Yeah, I've got a vested interest, haven't I? I should probably claim. Um, but my honest answer is uh, absolutely. So, so I can only speak from real life examples there. We've got clients who absolutely wouldn't have gone offshore, who are talking about offshore for all of the reasons we've all talked about today. Maybe it was never in their strategy, but actually, but certainly if I look at South Africa, where we've got next to zero attrition versus the UK, where we've, we've talked about the challenges and no wage inflation, no nothing. There is, there's a very real risk in my mind, not just in contact centers, but the UK kind of eats itself for, for a period of time here. And it's, it's almost, becomes almost impossible to stand something up here. Definitely, that's different from running something with tenured guys, but standing something up new is super challenging here. I mean, Mark, I know that you, you 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 use offshore as well. I mean, I mean, you know, have you got any thoughts on that one? Uh, yeah, I, I listen, I think it's a watching brief. I, I, I'm always of the opinion you should write show and the right activities should always be in the right places based on skills, destination, and you know the ability to attract people. Um, I think. It's up to each business to decide strategically. You know full well you can get great customer care offshore, whether that's South Africa, you know, India from a web chat perspective, um, for the right types of activities. And equally, there's a certain activity that are better done in the UK because of local knowledge, geography, etc. I don't think businesses should stray away from that strategically, but they need to make sure they're paying the right amounts and that they're set up in the right way in each of those locations. Um, I do think this will encourage more people where we know service can be done well offshore to consider offshore as Mike said. Mm -hmm. Okay and what strategies are we applying to retain staff? I, th I think I'll take this first but I think that um, you know today we've talked more around you know getting to know our employees with onboarding, having that relationship, communicating and connecting with our employees. I think that's really important. I, al I also think it's around for me as HR it's around understanding employees and understanding people or individuals so I think, you know, to retain people, if people don't want to work full time, then I think having the conversations and allowing them to be flexible with their hours, I think is great. I'm, I'm, I've always been an advocate of, of part time working. So, you know, I, I think there's lots of different things we can do there, you know, to retain people. But the first thing we need to do is listen to our people, you know, and understand, you know, you, you know, you, you know, how we can make their, you know, their work life and their work journey easier if, if they want it to be. So. So that's my thought. I mean, Joe, have you got any thoughts about, you know, strategies you're using to, to retain staff? Yeah, I mean, probably I've, I've kind of covered most of it, but I think yeah, absolutely understanding the individual because nobody, nobody is the same. Um, and, and I also think it's fair, you know, for the employees to understand the expectations of the role as well. So we've spoken a lot around the flexibility for the employee um, and you know, need them needing to feel part of the family and the the employer's um, uh, role within that, and the well-being initiatives we can offer. That's all great stuff. But they absolutely need to understand the expectations of the role as well. And I think that is that's really important because it is a two-way street. Um, and I think you know, thinking back to a previous question around you know recruitment, um, absolutely, are we being really um, explicit with what is expected of a contact centre role. Um, so we, we recruit right first time um, and we're not recruiting people when they get in and they don't understand what they're doing, don't, you know, don't really fully understand what, what the role would, did require. So for me, there's, there's, a, there's a whole host of things, but it's about um, absolutely understanding the individual employee because everybody's different, but also being really clear with their expectations and what we require of them to ensure that the business succeeds. Yeah, no, thanks, Joe. Um, and the next question is a really interesting one. And, I, and, and you know, I, I speak for myself here. I, I agree who, whoever wrote that question. But I think when we'd heard about, you know, furlough, when furlough was going to end, I, th I think we all thought perhaps, oh, my goodness, we're going to come into work and we're going to have thousands and thousands of applicants you know ready, ready to start talk to start you know having discussions with and 
um, you know, that didn't happen, did it? And I, th and I think the re one of the reasons I think it didn't happen as well is because with the end of furlough, I think some employees perhaps decided, you know, they wanted to do some something different. We read about people re retraining. We read about people wanting to go back more into like the NHS and caring and things like that. So I think people have had, had a think about what's important for them. Um, you know, and, and I think as well, you know, it's around, you know, when, when we're getting the applicants and things like that on here, um, you know, you know, we, we need to, like I said earlier, perhaps react really quickly um, and make sure that we can we can speak to people. But equally, one of the things that we did as well, uh, which worked really well, is we worked with different organisations that were helping, you know, people that haven't had the best start in life. So perhaps vulnerable people, etc. We we worked at Sigma with some of those organisations to be able to 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 give them a chance. So it it meant perhaps that we needed to give them some additional training and support and coaching. But it meant that you know we helped them with their IT skills and things like that. So I think I feel the pain when furlough ended. No, we didn't get thousands and thousands more applicants. It's still as tough. Um, but I think as well another reason for that perhaps is because the hospitality industry and all the different industries are also recruiting at the moment. So perhaps some of those people on furlough had so much choice. That's perhaps why we didn't see you know the the, the lots more people. So I don't know if anyone's got anything. Um, different to add to that on the panel. Mm -hmm. two, two things. Two things that I'm slightly Ill, Ill informed. So apologies if I get this wrong. But one of them, I think, is a huge percentage of people who were on furlough towards the end of the scheme were were in work doing something else. Yeah. I, I, I don't believe the scheme was exclusive that if you're on furlough you couldn't work. So so my understanding is most people had a dual income for a period of time and then backed that off to one income when the scheme ended rather than suddenly came to market screaming for jobs. And then the other one, which I really don't understand, is Brexit and the impact that had on the workforce and whether that's rippled through. Uh, I, I mean, clearly it has when we look at truck drivers and, and a bunch of other industries. I, I, I feel like we can't possibly be immune from, from even if it's not quite so direct, but from the, the knock-ons of that. Yeah, no, thanks, Mike. And the next question, um, you know, I think Joe's going to be um, answering this because Joe's background is all strategic L&D, so she's just brilliant at all that. So, Joe, do you just want to answer that question around training and changes that you've seen in, in Asda from, from the person who's, who's responsible for training across Europe and Africa? Yeah, I, I must. Um, I must admit, I, I think um, uh, from from an Asda perspective, um, you know, we we do what we've always done, and we do it very very well. It is um, on site training. Um, so new proposition recently. It is classroom based on site training. Um, I suppose we were able to um, bring that back into um, into the office, but in, in previous roles within John Lewis, um, very quickly set up a virtual um, a virtual training, and in terms of delivery method, that has absolutely been um, uh, has been the key difference. So going from a classroom based PowerPoint to virtual delivery, um, and much more. Um, chunks of learning um, and then back out on the floor to embed that learning so you know you, you don't you can't sit there for eight hours continually learning um, new systems and new processes you need chunks of learning you go out and you embed that learning learn learning through doing um, and it is and that, and that way we were able to get people on the floor um, taking calls quicker um, perhaps ring fencing the types of uh, queries they would take um, before getting them back into training to be trained on something else. It's very much about chunking it up into small sections um, and continually get them out on onto the floor. Um, and we were able to do that um, in a virtual in a virtual way. Um, so when I say on the floor, I mean they moved <laughs> to probably <laughs> logged on to their uh, and take customer calls with their team leader as support. Um, but yeah, that for me that was. Um, Absolutely, something that was in training, John Lewis, anyway, but it was accelerated by the um, by COVID um, because it was much easier in a virtual training environment, remotely at home, to have two-hour chunks of learning, have a break, and then go back to it um, because you can't sit at a screen um, for eight hours a day. So I hope that answers that that question. Brilliant, Joe. Thank you, Joe. It sounds great. And Mark, do you go to this person's asking about you know? 
um, colleges, universities? Do, do the very group go to job fairs? We, we do, yeah. We, we, we go to lots and lots of kind of job fairs, university forums, school leavers, I'm talking six form lever type events and uh, you know we, we would like to bring people in at all levels whether that's apprenticeship schemes or graduate schemes uh, you know to, to build a career here at the very group whether that's in customer care whether that's in buying or merchandising etc so uh, our, our talent team here spend a lot of time at those kind of forums brilliant thank you um, and the question from Sarah is around um, you know, are we are we adapting our, our interviews now? It's rem remotely. Um, I, th I think hopefully, Sarah. You know, we we've talked about some of the things we're doing. I know that some organisations at the moment, you know, are doing everything online. They're using some really good technology. Um, so the person when they apply just does everything online and, and doesn't actually you know speak to the business. So so Sarah, if you want to contact me separately, I can talk to you about that. But you know, it's good to hear from a recruitment partner like yourself, Sarah, that you know the onboarding and things that all of your clients are doing but you know chat to me after about that so I'm happy to go into that with the technology side of things um, um, I think what was the other question? sorry about this there's so many questions which is brilliant I was worried there wouldn't be that but there's loads of questions so thank you um, customer satisfaction yeah this is a good one so so I guess um, you know perhaps perhaps Mark shall we start with you and go to Mark with that so with, it, with the importance of employee well-being how do you ensure continuous customer satisfaction during times where where you said Mark, uh, Mark that you that you turned off the phones? Listen, we're, we're really honest with our customers. Um, we, we, when we do turn the phones off, we tell them we're investing in our teams for an hour, and that seems to have landed well with customers. And um, we do it the less busy times of the week when we've got you know minimal traffic coming in. So we, we make sure we balance that from an operational perspective. And that time invested in well-being has had a direct correlation on, you know, our employee satisfaction, which has in turn had a direct correlation on, you know, how happy our customers are in our first contact resolution. So all these things work intrinsically together. A customer's not going to forgive you for being, uh, sorry, a customer's not going to hold it against you necessarily for being shut for an hour, as long as when they do ring, you resolve that query first time and the people on the phone are doing it in a great way. So we do have to be more balanced on this moving forward. And, they, you know, we don't do it every week or every day. It's a, it's a once a month, once a quarter thing. But the engagement and the recognition that gets from the teams is, is fantastic. Thank you, Mark. And I just think, um, just going through a couple of questions because I'm conscious of the time. So um, we're considering video interviews. I've seen video interviews work, as Mark said, with our partner, and Mike said, with our partner. I think video video um, can work really, really well as part of um, online interview uh, interviews. So, and there's lots of great um, organisations out there. So, again, if anybody wants to talk to me about that, please uh, please message me on LinkedIn. Um, I think um, you're going to send the polls out. What's the attrition rate that we're seeing on our frontline teams? Um, you know, I think um, Mike, Mike, should we talk about attrition? One of our favourite yeah. subjects, okay. I would say, Mark. I was, hoping to, I was hoping to dodge that question. That's the point. That's the pointed question in Just the room. Briefly. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to give a slightly evasive answer. We've got we've got a range. We've got in South Africa, it's trending at like two percent a month, which is stunning. At its best in the UK for us at the moment, and I'm talking about where we're in a ramp. So it's perhaps the other guys might maybe will have slightly better numbers than these. But you know, I I feel like if you're 5% a month, 60% annualized at the moment in frontline, you're, do you're doing amazingly. You know, the worst I'm seeing at the moment is greater than 200% annualized. Uh, and that's across a range of places that I've spoken to. Campaigns that we've run, campaigns I've seen, uh, our peers running in-house and outsourced operations. Um, you know, if, if I go back to this time last year, 40% a year, the same campaign might be running at 200% now in the UK, which I guess is you know, really significant part of the challenge that we're all talking about here. Okay. Um, the a final question is around understanding the importance of retaining great talent. Um, you know, what's our views on a mix of permanent and, 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 and fixed term contracts? Uh, I know at Sigma, you know, we, we, have, we have permanent employees and it really works. Um, but equally, I guess if, if we have a short term project, we'd have fixed term contract. But I don't know Joe and Mark, what your views are? Do you, do you recruit most people on permanent contracts? Yeah. 90%, yeah. 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 
yeah and we, we we do we do a mix we have got some fixed term contracts um for pacific projects uh but yeah it is generally permanent brilliant okay well i think that was the last question so thank you very much for all those questions it was really really good to get such a such a variation so thank you for that so chantelle shall i hand back to you Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was a, a brilliant session. We didn't actually get to polls because we had so many questions. Um, so what I'll do is I will put them in an email and the follow up email um, because it would still be good to ask our audience those questions and just to get their feedback on, on the questions that we ask. So have a look, a look out for those in your inbox. Um, if anybody would like to talk directly to our panellists, um, I will speak to the panellists about what contact details I can put in our follow up email that will come out to you within the next 24 hours. Um, so Joe, I know you said you you would continue yeah. conversations there so um, I will liaise with the, the panelists and let you know in your follow-up emails which will also contain the recording um, for this session as well um, so, so I'm going to conclude today's session we have overrun a bit I'm really sorry thank you for sticking with us um, and I'd just like to take the, uh, to thank everybody for taking the time to attend I hope that uh, you thoroughly enjoyed the session a very special thank you to Joe. Mike, Joanne and Mark for participating in our panel today. Again, if you have any further questions, I will speak to my panellists and get some contact details out for you. Um, so for more information on membership of UKCCF and for a full list of all upcoming UKCCF webinars and uh, we are going back to face-to-face -face networking, uh, networking events in 2022. We will continue the webinars, um, but we are so looking forward to seeing you all again live in the flesh <laughs> rather than through technology. <laughs> exactly. Um, we're going to be at Contact Centre Expo in a couple of weeks as well. Please come along. It'll be so lovely to see all of you um, and, and get that face-to-face that -face contact back again. We've also recently relaunched our e-magazine website, which is Contact Centre Monthly. It's brand new. looks really great. Have a look. It's www.contactcentermonthly.co.uk for all of your industry news, white papers, resources, etc. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us thank you again panel take care everybody have a wonderful thank afternoon you. and i look forward to welcoming you all again very soon thank you everybody thank you bye 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 bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.